I was the bad guy in every country I walked into. Last part of my career, I had switched from wearing body armor and night vision and kicking doors in over to wearing business casual, flying business class, and not working inside the theaters of war. Here are my lessons learned from being the bad guy, from being the predator. Having a little bit of analog in your life, meaning you're doing stuff with your hands and you're doing it yourself, will only benefit you and it'll benefit you in more ways than you can imagine. The pandemic has made us more lazy, more complacent. That was one of the wake up calls. It was just a personal endeavor. Like, hey, no, you need to do it yourself. Stop relying on this whole like delivery system. No, oh, I'm just trying to give them tools that they can add to their toolbox. you say on a on a recent interview that when people leave the seals when they leave the military and then they go off into the quote unquote real world that often soldiers kind of don't understand how transferable all of those skills all of the learning everything that you've been through how it applies to real life what would you say is the number one skill set that as a seal as someone who's done some pretty badass things that you bring to the real world the number one that I mean, overall, I think military experience allows any member to get out. And I would say something as simple as follow through, right? I mean, mm. you're never going to half-ass a task in the military. And even if you do, you're going to get called out and be told, hey, don't do that again, right? And so even if you're a young, you know, soldier, sailor, airman, whatever, and you do half-ass it, you know, you're going to get corrected. And in the rest of your career, you're going to know just how important it is to complete the task, follow through with everything you say and everything you're supposed to do. And so getting out, you realize that we're pretty good at that. And we know how to task organize whatever the whatever the the event, the program, whatever it is you're working on. Um, you task organize, task organize it all the way to completion. And what I've noticed is in the civilian side, you, that's not a characteristic that's inherent to anybody in business or not at all. <laughs> right. So you're like, here I am following through on a regular basis. And then, you know, and it's a good place to be when I'm the one waiting on everyone else. Right. But that gets a little annoying too sometimes. Yeah. But I feel like a lot of guys don't realize that that in itself is a huge skill to start something, organize it so that you can complete it and then actually finish it in a timely manner. And as you know, I mean, that could apply to daily communication with emails or to, you know, for me, putting these books together. Yeah, that, that's everything. My wife yeah. often gets frustrated because if someone says something, if, if she says something, she's going to do it. Yeah. I say yeah. stuff all the time that I never follow through with. And so I I like <laughs> I know about myself that I'm I'm a starter. If that's a thing, I don't know, are there starters or are they finishers? Who knows? But I'm a starter. I get super excited. I can kick off something, I can imagine something. But then I just get bored because it's the grind and it's the work and it's the delivery and all of that stuff. And so I used to beat myself up for it. And then now I start to just embrace that I'm a starter and I need to hand it over to finishers, but is this all bullshit? Like in, in looking through the lens of your experience, the follow through is something that I struggle with that we all struggle with. How do we get better yeah. at that? Man, I mean, I have my moments, but I'm a list person. And I, I have tried to be a list person on a digital device. It just doesn't work for me. I have to, there's something about going, you know, whatever's on my brain and transferring it to paper in writing that really makes following through a whole lot easier. And so what I have is a ongoing list and this list just, it's long and I add to it every day. But the one thing I've always done is circle the priorities for that day, right? Mm. And then as soon as they're done, mark them out. And then inevitably there's always more on the list. So then I circle the next priorities and then mark them out. And by if it, always, if it, if it lasts long enough, like if it's if it's been on the list for months and you're never getting around to it, is do you just like dump it? No, I, ironically, I mean those those things end up actually 
becoming a priority at some point because let's say it's pay a bill, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I'm go oh, set up auto pay for this bill. And it's like 30 days. Well, guess what? On day 29, it becomes a priority. Uh, or if you're like me, I'm, I'm like, hey, I'm okay with the late fee for, uh, you know, at least whatever, a couple of, yeah. maybe another 30 days. When you cross but, it off, when you knock it off, do you, do you like pat yourself on the back? Do you celebrate it? Do you do anything at all? Or it's just like next, next, let's go. It, it's just the next, next thing. Because as I cross them off, that is the satisfaction. That is the, that's the reward is going, okay, I don't have to worry about that again. Or if it's a 30 day thing, then, okay, I don't have to worry about that for another 30 days, but you're just checking that shit off. But if you're always kind of circling and identifying the priorities, then you're going to start and finish a whole lot of stuff. At least that's what works for me. Now, I know when you left the military, you developed a company to help with crisis management. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if you want to talk to people who know a thing or two about crisis, work with some SEALs. Yeah. Uh, and so what were you most surprised about, though? Again, like because because I'm, I'm so curious about the things that we all do that come natural to us that we don't even recognize when you drop yourself into a different environment that people value it. And you don't even value it because it's just it's been trained into you or it comes naturally to you or you do it. And so for all of our listeners, they all have God given gifts that they've been given. Yeah. And they may not even recognize what a gift it is to others. So you go into crisis management. Uh, what were the what were the crises that that you found that you could really help people with? Going into it, I wasn't sure what these Fortune 500s were going to need because I'm a military guy and I had no exposure to the corporate world, right? Um, so that was kind of the first big obstacle. But I had been to enough conferences that related to industrial security, corporate security to see gaps or what I felt like were gaps. They sound fun, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're a whole lot of fun. Let me tell you, nothing but best practices and policies. Um, but those gaps that I identified is what I concentrated on. And so going into a company, probably the biggest surprise and lesson learned I had with the first Fortune 500 I worked with was the lack of preparedness. They just didn't have anything. And you would, when you look at a, a, a multi billion dollar company, you think, oh, they're going to have everything squared away. The guys running the crisis department is probably going to know more than me. You know, what, what am I got myself into? Until you go in, you got your little pitch deck, and, you, uh, and then you start talking and you start seeing in their eyes that, oh, I am bringing up some things they may not have thought about, or I've simplified some processes that they made a little too complicated. And that's why it was becoming a burden for them to try and push whatever it was. Right. And so anyway, um, the crisis is that, you know, that I was focused on initially was safe travel abroad. That was one thing I had my own lessons learned that I felt were very valuable for civilians. Right. So I, last part of my career, I traveled the globe working pretty much solo alone I had switched from wearing body armor and night vision and kicking doors in over to wearing business casual, flying business class, and not working inside the theaters of war. Um, and so when you do that and you're actually conducting a mission, uh, awareness becomes more important than anything else, right? I started going, wait a minute, I'm, I'm kind of on my own. I don't have any, I don't have like a, a QRF or what we call a quick reaction, a quick reaction force is going to come rescue me if things go sideways. I'm truly on my own. And so doing that over and over again created this, this list of lessons learned. And then as I started to get out, I thought, you know what? If you're a journalist, let's say you travel alone, you meet with dangerous people, and then you report on it, right? And you stamp your name to it. <laughs> so they were the first ones I kind of went after because I felt like in light of Danny Pearl, who got his head cut off on YouTube, um, you know, journalists needed, you know, some really good best practices so that they could go out and conduct meets with a complete stranger, collect information and, and actually go home alive. Right. And so my first client ended up being the Wall Street Journal. 
do you find yourself asking then and even today like who am i like the little bit of the imposter syndrome who am i to be able to step into this or does that disappear as soon as you realize that the person you're across doesn't know what they're talking about <laughs> You know, the imposter thing still is there. I think it is for everyone. An entrepreneur who dives into new territory at any given time and, you know, they find themselves standing in a room with people who have been doing whatever it is for 20, 20 years of their life. Um, I think a little bit definitely exists. But once you actually get in front of them and you, I'm really good about saying, hey, I am not one of you. I'm actually something different. And that's what's going to benefit you. You know, I was the bad guy in every country I walked into. You are all good people, right? Doing good things. I was the bad guy. <laughs> so once you kind of say, hey, you are you and I am and I and I am who I am, then here are my lessons learned from being the bad guy, from being the predator. And I think these things will actually benefit you. Um, you know, I'm not trying to be them and I'm not trying to teach them something that they already know. I'm just trying to give them tools that they can add to their toolbox, you know? And uh, anyway, so that, that really, uh, I, that was a, that was an eye opener for me standing in front of them and, uh, and kind of going through the things that I thought I brought to the table. And then, you know, months later actually getting the contract and going, Holy shit. You know, like I just went from, you know, absolutely zero to a very prestigious news agency as being a client, which is crazy, but that's kind of how it all started. I love this so much because if you break down what we've been covering, it's follow through. Seems like a, a pretty, like, like we're all looking for the magic formula. Yeah. We're all looking for the simpler way, the easier way, but follow through. So, so do a to-do list, set priorities, knock yeah. them out, do them in the right order. And then when you go in and you're working with these big companies in terms of crisis management, be prepared, ask yeah. tough questions, seek out the answers to those tough questions. Like just, so much of this is just do the work. It is. It, it's crazy, isn't it? It's a little bit. I mean, I think where, where people kind of get off step is consistency, right? It's easy to go, yeah, okay, I'm going to make, make my list and I'm going to check the things off that are important for the day. And then I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do that. But maintaining that every single day and doing what needs to be done every single day. I think that's where people get started. They expect a whole lot of return, whatever, how, you know, whatever value return is for them. And then when they don't get it immediately, then they get discouraged and then they get distracted or they think of a better process or a better way. Whereas if they just stick to whatever process they design and let the process evolve to what you're doing you'll be better off than, than stopping, starting, stopping, starting, and then going over here and get doing this. Well, I'm going to do it this way. Well, I'm going to buy a new, or I'm going to use this new organizational app. I don't know. I didn't like that one. I'm going to switch over to this one because my buddy said that one's better. And, you know, we all do it in some form or fashion. It could be a fitness app. You know, you download it and you pay the monthly, you start to do it for two days and you realize, ah, I don't like the graphics on this one. Okay. Now I'm going to go over here to this one. <laughs> you know, it's like one thing after another, and there's so many options out there today that I think the self-discipline of, no, I'm just going to limit myself to this. I'm going to pretend there's nothing else out there. I'm going to let this process evolve. And eventually it's going to plane out and it's going to really work for me, you know, because I don't, you know, I don't uh, go and research, you know, methods of organization or how do I get my day done? You know, I just don't do any of that. I just kind of stumble through it on my own and figure out what works and then just stick to it. Yeah. Now you wrote a book, the right kind of crazy. Mm. What is the right kind of crazy? I mean, we can all imagine the wrong kind, I guess. What's the right kind? <laughs> yeah. The, the wrong kind is any X that you have in your life that did all kinds of crazy Well, they shit say that you. we're all somebody's X somewhere in the world, right? Yeah. That's, well, that's we're, true. We're, we're all an asshole somewhere. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, or the other, the flip side is if you, if you got 50, 50% 50 of people like what you do and the other 50% hate what you do, then you're doing something right. I've always kind of wondered like, wait, how, how does that work? <laughs> well, you listen, uh, Bobby Kennedy uh, was quoted as saying 30% of people will, will not like you. And, and 30, so, <laughs> there we go. That's better. I like so, that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's what he said back in the sixties and lots of people didn't like the Kennedy. So, uh, but what yeah. is the right kind of crazy? The right kind of crazy. Um, I, I, it, it, 
the best way I can describe it is uh, bad decisions make, make for great stories, right? And so The Right Kind of Crazy is a book full of bad decisions. <laughs> and so I, I, I truly am an open book. It is a memoir of sorts, but it, the goal is to humanize uh, myself because when you carry, you know, uh, the title of a retired Navy SEAL, there's a certain amount of mythical bullshit that people formulate in their mind. And so I had read enough of the special operation books that were out there to go, okay, let's shed some light on the truth and not carry the torch that everyone else has carried prior to me when they wrote a, a book on, you know, I was a badass and then I went and became a badass and then I was a badass my entire career and then I retired and I'm still a badass. I mean, that is not me. I made bad decision after bad decision after bad decision and spliced in there were some good outcomes, you know, and then you learn from that and then you move forward and you continue to move forward and hopefully you achieve your passion, dreams and goals in life. And so I wanted to just really be me in that book. It's got a whole lot of humor, you know, and a whole lot of fun stories that I think people will relate to at the end of the day. Which one is the one that you look back on today, regret-free, but at the time you had trouble getting over? Oh, that's a good and question. The, the reason I ask that is because so much, uh, like we can regret everything and never let go mm -hmm. of anything and, and be stuck. Uh, for myself, <laughs> you know, I have this small story, this small thing where it's like, yeah, it's, it's a story, but we were renovating uh, the kids' program area at the church I went to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm, I'm like the guy who's like going to get in there. And I have a lot of experience in construction. We're going to talk about the rugged life and building stuff soon, but I have a lot of experience in construction. And so I'm up on the ladder and, and I'm busy knocking out joist hangers. And I didn't really notice that like one of our elderly board members is like walking over and looking up at me and I'm hammering down and I just hit this, you know, this one by three and it knocks it down and it, and it goes straight into his nose. Oh. almost breaks his nose, knocks his glasses over. This lovely man in his like 60s or 70s is like knocked to the ground. And I'm just like, oh, oh shit. And I felt horrible. And I called him yeah. the next day and apologized. And then I avoided him a bit. That was, <laughs> I don't know, six years ago. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know what lesson to learn from that other than, hey, Mark, when you're getting excited about this stuff, like maybe you don't be the guy to always jump in. Maybe what, worry about health and safety. Maybe think some of these things through. And so there's something, but but I still just feel bad about it. Well, and so I'm always curious yeah. about that turning point from from regret to reframing it. Uh, what's one of the the best lessons you've learned? Oh boy, yeah. I think um, one of the stories I put in the book is uh, you know basic. I was married and uh, and unhappily. Right. And so I wandered off the pasture. I got into this communication relationship with a, uh, with a CIA girl. Right. And, you know, a lot of com communication going back and forth. It was started as all business, but eventually it turns into, Hey, you know, how's your day going? It turns into small talk, small talk, then turns into more, uh, personal issues. So then she's complaining about her husband. I'm complaining about my wife before you know it, right? It's you're in really bad territory and you don't even realize it. Sometimes it just kind of happens over time and you don't think anything of it, but, um, but I did it. And, and then when I decided, no, you know what? I don't want to go down this path any longer. She really didn't take that very well. Right. And so I started backing off and then she was all in. Right. But that was something I didn't realize or know or notice at the time. Um, and so she just hit the nuke button. Right. She went mm -hmm. ahead and told her husband mm -hmm. and then her husband was like an FBI guy. Right. <laughs> so we got right CL, CIA so, and FBI guy. And, yeah. then, and then your former wife. Yeah. This, and the story is, uh, it's ridiculous. But basically, this guy hears all that. And then what she did is she went ahead and like added 
a whole lot of amplifying information that wasn't necessarily true to the relationship. Just to provide more context and color, of course. Exactly. And she just really wanted to hurt the guy. At the end of the day, it was the big thing, right? She just wanted to hurt him in some form or fashion. So, you know, telling him like what's been going on and then adding in a whole bunch of stuff that wasn't true. Well, eventually, you know, that guy then calls my wife, right? And tells her parts that were true and then a whole bunch of stuff that wasn't. And, you know, and it, you, it's very difficult to like defend yourself when half of it is the truth and the other half isn't. But in the end, it all happened the way that it did. And it's allowed us, you know, now we're, we're really good friends and we've raised an awesome girl, you know, and this has been heck a decade now, to, you know, I've been divorced, give or take. Yeah. So, you know, but it was, uh, you know, it was a wake up call, you know, on how crazy things can get, you know, you take one step in the wrong direction and it, someone can very easily add a thousand steps to it for you, you know, without you ever doing a damn thing, you know? And do you, do you think if you had known what you, I mean, obviously if you know then what you know now, we would all live our lives very differently, oh, yeah. but knowing that it would all potential, it would potentially blow up anyway, and you'd have to have the hard conversations and you'd have to face the truth and you'd have to work through it. And ultimately it would lead to a happier outcome in the end um, because you've been able to renegotiate your relationship and all of that stuff um, mm -hmm. when you face these new challenges going forward. Because because I've kind of, I, I've bent myself backwards and I think everyone has, but I've worked so hard not to fire people that ultimately I have to fire and not to, not to have the hard conversation that I ultimately have to have and oh, not yeah. to admit the thing that I ultimately have to admit. And, um, and whether this is uh, things that we're addicted to, uh, mm -hmm. whether this is things that we know that we shouldn't be doing, you know, I always say to myself, how come I don't do the things that I know I should be doing and I do the things that I know I shouldn't be doing? Like, and so I've come to just trust, oh, crap. Okay. If I do this thing now, it's so much better than if I put it off and do it later. Uh, ha have you learned that lesson and been able to carry it through? I would say for the most part, you know, I think some of us are just ingrained to whatever the, the reason. Hard way? <laughs> yeah. Do the hard way, you know, and, 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 and sometimes the reasoning behind it is what kind of pushes you down that path. For me, it's like, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Ah. Right. And you don't want to, you know, be the bad guy. Right. And, and the other piece of it, you know, for a lot of SEALs is you don't want to quit because when you say, I don't want to do this anymore, or, Hey, you know, I gotta, I kind of need to, you know, whatever it is, gotta close this, close this up, wrap this up, finish this, whatever it is, you know, it feels like a form of quitting. Mm. And, uh, so I think that's, you know, it's a, it's a combination of stuff. It's not simple. It's a very complex, you know, little world when you talk about emotions and, and everything that encapsulate, encapsulates a relationship, right? I mean, it's a, it's, it can be complicated. It can be easy though, too, but it just takes, uh, that's, that's changing your mindset about stuff because the times that I have owned it and gone, hey, this isn't working there is this huge sense of relief as soon as you say it, like, Oh God, I'm so glad I did that. <laughs> like, yeah. You don't realize it, you know, at the time you're just like, Oh my God, you're the, and the anxiety of hurting someone's feelings or letting someone down, you know, that is what I tend to hold on to. And the reason why, you know, something goes longer than it should. But then when you finally build the courage to just say what needs to be said, then there's that sense of relief. And then you're like, why didn't I do this, you know, a month ago? Yeah. <laughs> so and it's I, like, it's like this balance, you know, that, you know, or it's just an, I don't know. It's a hard thing to put into words. Right. Well, that's, that's, you know, what I'm hearing though, is again, you talked about how the badass persona, right. Kicking in doors and putting on the night vision goggles. And, you know, I just imagine you in water at night, like coming out and you're like all in black and just doing all this cool stuff. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I know there's lots of debriefs and paperwork and training and all that yeah, other stuff yeah. too, but, but you just imagine all this stuff. And then for, for, for us to hear you say, you know, like have the courage to say the words, it's like, 
how, how can how can you do all of that? How can you turn off fear or embrace fear or do all of that stuff when you're in the moment? And then all these other things, you're just as human as the rest of us. Um, I think that's the thing that that the general public and even myself, having spoken to a bunch of seals, like we just can't square away. How can you do all this badass stuff? How can you be the hundred deadly skills guy? How can yeah. you be able to do all this stuff and then go like, it was really hard to sit down with my wife and talk to her. <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's it, and what's funny is it's pretty much the same for most guys. I know. Um, it really, I mean, we are, you know, we're good at, the whatever it is we're passionate about, you know, which is obviously work and work is that, that lifestyle is easy compared to dealing with relationships, you know, and, and, uh, interestingly enough, a majority of my buddies all come from broken homes. So there is an aspect of constantly trying to prove to ourselves that we're worthy in some form or fashion and is why we continue to excel at our job, but yet never feel like we've accomplished a damn thing. And it Ooh, keeps us going further that hurts, and further. That hurts my heart. <laughs> yeah. And it, but in that same kind of mindset and philosophy also applies to our relationships and other things, you know? And, and so, um, unlike, unlike a relationship, a mission has a start and a finish, Right but a relationship is on always there and always ongoing and, and uh, needs a whole lot more attention, needs a whole lot more of emotion, <laughs> you know, which guys like me aren't good at. Um, and so it's two separate worlds. So it's easy to be, you know, a stone cold killer. I mean, it really is compared to having to deal with, you know, some of the things back home. And that's where, you know, the brotherhood, uh, sometimes that bond and that family that you have when you're overseas is far stronger than the family you have at home. It's a, it's a, it's a very, uh, it's a different world for sure. I, I want to switch gears if I can. Let's talk yeah. about the rugged life. So uh, this, this new book, I get an advanced copy of it. I'm reading the Ford and I'm like, Hell yes. I love where we're going with this. You know, this <laughs> yeah. idea of the more that we take on, the more that we own our environment, our world, and whether this is like, we can call it homesteading, but whether this is uh, farming or, or raising, uh, raising livestock or animals, yeah. or big picture, small things, <clears throat> building your own home, whatever it is. I'm like, yes, the, the more we do, the less we rely on other people. I don't want to rely on anyone. I love That's this. Right. And then I'm flipping through the book and I'm like, oh, I thought this was going to be like when I when I hit a chapter of like how to be your own butcher, I'm thinking this is an analogy for like cutting the people out of your life or how to be a farmer. <laughs> I'm thinking this is an analogy for like how to plant, you know, proper things so that way they pay off. In the f no, 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 no. This is like a page by page, <laughs> how to milk a goat, you know, uh, uh, the, the best crops per quarter acre and, and the, the climate zones. And like, this is, this is a crazy how-to guide where you can do as much or as little as you want to be more independent and sustainable. Right. Yeah. You why did it. you write this? <laughs> you know, um, the, the, the why boils down to the pandemic, Right. So during the pandemic, I had I was driving the country doing combat edition where I was meeting with all of these badasses that are experts in their own little vertical of combatives, you know, shooters, knife throwers, hand to hand guys. And that was, you know, in, but, dur but, but when I did it, the highways of America were empty and you were hearing about toilet paper, you know being, you know, obviously not to be found. And I just thought to myself how strange all this was, right? Like what the fuck is going on around here? So during that drive, I realized, you know, Hey, I'm putting together books that allow you to survive, you know, seconds, minutes, hours, and days. But what America and what the globe actually really needs is no, you just need to know how to have a lifestyle that gives you all the things you need without having to rely on everything else. Right. 
And we've all but, become... But, but why? So when, when shit goes down, you're okay? Or, or for the love of it? That, that's what I couldn't figure out. Well, there's two parts. Right? There's multiple parts, actually. Because as I started to build the book, you start to realize more and more of how important this is. Number one is every American male, female, and kid in this country just 200 years ago knew everything in this book and then some, right? It is what this country was founded on. So there's a little bit of patriotism and going back to our roots built into this. And I think it's important everybody remember that piece because we have come pretty fast, you know, in a very short period of time. And now everything is 100% digital and very little is analog, but it is the analog that is going to work for you no matter what happens on this planet, right? And so having a little bit of analog in your life, meaning you're doing stuff with your hands and you're doing it yourself, will only benefit you and it'll benefit you in more ways than you can imagine. But we are into this whole instant gratification type world where, you know, I want that food delivered to my front doorstep. The pandemic has made us more lazy, more complacent, because it was all about how do I get everything I need through my phone and delivered to my door, which to me is ridiculous, right? I mean, it just seems so, it's so it's such a bizarre time we've, we've had the opportunity of living through. And that was one of the wake up calls. Like, no, people just that, it was just a personal endeavor. Like, hey, no, you need to do it yourself. Stop relying on <laughs> this whole like delivery system. Yeah. You know, I'm going con- to play devil's advocate for a second because yeah, sure. I believe in what you're saying and, and we'll dig into that. But um, you also kind of sound like the guy or the, or the, or the, the girl who um, mourns the passing of cursive writing. You know, like, like my in-laws bring up all the time that cursive writing is no longer taught in our school systems. And I go, well, that's cool. It's, it's a great skill to have. Yes, letter writing is a great skill as well. But how will that serve our children as they grow up in the digital age, it's, it makes more sense for them yeah. to learn how to type or, right. you know, or how to spell or grammar or all of these things. So is there a certain amount of like, just, you know, you're, you're caught up in the romanticism of no, not be? at all. There's, there's one word on the, in the subtitle of this thing, right? Modern. So that's the key takeaway. I'm not saying throw your cell phones out. I'm just saying, no, you can use all of your technology to actually be more self-reliant. And I talk about it throughout the book, you know, it, you, how to leverage your phone in a lot of other ways in order to help promote the self-reliance piece. I'm saying cut out your 100% reliance. <laughs> like it's insane to, you know, every little thing that we do involves a phone And, but if you want to create an air gap between you and the next virus, between you and the next supply chain issue, between you and all of these different, you know, crises we keep facing, you know, round after round, the air gap is self-reliance, right? So that, oh, okay, that crazy world isn't touching me when it comes to my food or, oh, that crazy world isn't touching me when it comes to having to fix something in my house, right? Just create, you know, it doesn't have to be full-on little house on the prairie. Um, I'm not saying that at all, nor would I live that lifestyle. That's, I mean, you know, it's no, let's implement a little bit here, a little bit there. Um, One, because I feel like once people do it, they'll go, oh, I should have been doing this all along. This is great. Like having a window seal garden of basil that I can then pick it and put it into my meal right then and there. How cool is that? But they've forgotten how to do these little things that, you know, support the self-reliance piece that I'm pushing and you can have fun with it. And also it brings the families back together. Right now you got, you know, four and a half people sitting in a living room, all of them on their devices and not paying attention to the TV that's on, (laughs) which is crazy. The TV's on and everybody's sitting there staring at their phones. And, um, but you know, these, these are projects that even families can kind of start doing together and, you know, mom and dads can start raising their kids with a little bit of hands-on knowledge again, um, because that's I'm what gonna, I grew up I'm, with. I know, I know you grew up in Saudi Arabia and, um, and, and you've kind of been all over the place, but I'm, I yeah. want to push you a little bit more on this too, because again, it's, it's a really great guide. 
Yeah. Um, I learned a lot, but um, I've also dipped into these types of guys. Like I grew up in a household where I grew up in the city. And then when I was uh, 13 years old, we moved halfway between two little towns mm. on a 70 acre property. And we hand built a stack log home. So we built yeah. our own home. You You're know, good. we got the cedar. I spent weeks stripping cedar logs that we cut into 16 inch pieces. <laughs> we mixed mortar the traditional way. We built a stack oh, wow. log home. And then I lived in this in this house that was uh, that was only heated through uh, radiant heating, underground radiant heating that was this uh, wood burning, huge wood burning thing that we would load twice a day. Uh, and so it was like two hours a day of yeah. pulling out the uh, the ash, loading it up. Uh, you know, hardwood was always better, you know, cutting everything. We would like we lived this way and I did that for two or three years. Um, and so maybe I'm a little bit PTSD about it, but you spend <laughs> yeah. so much time, so much time and effort trying to live this way that the entrepreneur side of me goes, who has time for this? So, so I love that we could yeah, yeah. do this. We could yeah. do this, but, but still why write this guide? Why write this book? What are you, what, like, what, why is your heart into this? Well, because no one had a backup plan. No one had anything uh, when, when the pandemic occurred. And that's so really, really cool. when shit goes down, when it really goes bad. And I think people are embracing more of the, oh, I got to do it myself. I think it's slowly starting to kick in, right? That self-reliance piece is starting to become important again, not because it's going to be a primary lifestyle, but because I need to just know how to do this so that when things go bad, I can get through those bad moments without having to rely on other people that aren't, that are not going to be there for you. Right. That's really what it boiled down to. I mean, so you know, you brought up be your own power grid or be your own heating source, right? That's those chapters aren't about, hey, do this as a primary thing. It's more like, no, just think about it for a second. A five thousand dollar generator hooked up to your panel that's out in the garage can go a long way the next time the power goes out, especially here in Texas, where the grid failed catastrophically just one winter ago. And you had people dying and freezing to death, which is crazy in Texas, right? I mean, just, you know, people think of it as just hot all the time here, but it isn't. And so, you know, have that backup plan and that backup plan should be built on the foundation of self-reliance, not the backup plan of, I'm just going to go ahead and have an Amazon account and Netflix, just in case one of those go down. I've still got movies yeah. to watch. <laughs> you know, every, every, I live in the Northeast. Uh, I actually live in Canada, but um, I say the Northeast because then it makes me sound American. But, uh, <laughs> but um, every winter when we hear on the news that, that a family has passed away because they were running, um, you know, space heaters or something that was throwing off carbon monoxide. Um, oh boy, yeah. And, and I just, I was, I always scratch my head. I'm just like thinking, how, how could that be? But, you know, I guess I, I've always, I, I haven't even appreciated that the years I spent in a construction family, building these things, doing these things, trying these things, I realized, I honestly believe that I can do anything, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, the other side of me goes, I can't do that. But, but I know with, with enough time with YouTube <laughs> yeah, exactly. and maybe with some guidance, it's like, yeah, I could, I can do that and I can do that. And I find myself doing all these kinds of things that I shouldn't. Um, but it's actually trained in me and, and on the business side of thing, on the entrepreneurial side, uh, there's this concept of who, not how, uh, Dan Sullivan, uh, came up with it from strategic coach, Ben Hardy, Dr. Ben Hardy wrote this great book on it, but I've been, I've, I've realized I am a how person, right? Like, how are we going to do this? How can we approach it? How can we fix it? What can we do? Like, how, 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 how? You talk about like raising bees and stuff in the book. Like, I've been thinking for years about, about farming bees because, um, you know, we have access to water. We can plant apple trees. Uh, it's, it's really great. I want to be part of the solution for bees. But I don't have time to do all the stuff that I want to do. Like, I want to do everything all the time. And yeah. there's not enough time. So I'm actually training myself to become a better who person. Finding people, trusting people is really hard for me. Getting other people to do these things for me. So as I was flipping through your book as well, I was going, hmm, I want to do everything you're talking about. I want to make goat's milk. I want to go hunting. <laughs> like, yeah. like I want to do everything you're talking about, but I just don't have enough time. So for right. what would be your advice for someone like me who 
who wants to do everything but just doesn't have the time to do it. And we're training ourselves to actually rely more on other people. Yeah. Well, I mean, first and foremost, the rugged life in itself is a full-time job. So Mm. it's very difficult to go, okay, yeah, I'm going to do all these things and have a, you know, a full-time actual real job. Uh, You're not going to be able to pull it off. And I'm very honest about that in the book. You know, most of, most of everything in the book, number one is hard. It's not easy. Yeah. Um, You have to be willing to fail over and over again. You have to have the mindset of student, not teacher, right? (laughs) You've got to constantly be willing to learn. Um, And you've got to learn to kind of almost appreciate, you know, every aspect of whatever it is you pick out of this book to do, or you will learn to appreciate it. And you'll learn to appreciate yourself and you'll learn to appreciate the people that do it for a living and provide it to your front door every time you order it, right? I mean, so... But it's not easy. It's not cheap either, right? That's one of the that's one of the surprising things that I found is that when I traveled and went to people who were on grid, off grid, these families, and you ask them, "So, are you saving money?" No, like it's not cheap to be self sufficient. You would have to go all in to really, over time, have things actually become cheaper, right? But is it cheaper to go buy a carton of eggs or to have 12 chickens, right? <laughs> carton of eggs every day of the week. It's cheaper to have your uncle have eggs and give them to you for free. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so that is actually the better takeaway because I talk about you building a village is actually the better concept here in self-reliance and having a backup plan. So in your neighborhood, you can be the chicken guy. Your neighbor can be the tomato guy. You know, the other neighbor can be, you know, the basil guy, right? Yeah. Because he doesn't have the space to grow anything else. Or in your neighbor down the road can be the potato person, right? So you can spread out some of these projects amongst a neighborhood and you've got a, you know, you've got your shopping list covered really. So there's a lot of ways to tackle this and to really one, have fun with it. Um, but at the same time, have your backup plan, you know, and I'm not a paranoid guy. I'm not a prepper guy. I'm just, I'm just not one of those people. I just realized that the things that I did as the gopher for my dad, Hey, go grab me that wrench. Hey, go grab me this. Hey, do this, do that. You know, all of those things over time, I realized, wow, I'm actually, I actually know how to do a lot of stuff. But when I would talk to my buddies or, you know, whoever, I realized they didn't know how to do a damn thing. Right. And so the goal with it really is, hey, let's give some skills back. Let's get people to start embracing the I can do it myself mentality. And then at the same time, kind of the reward is that you're creating that air gap that kind of protects you from the next crisis. I think I think I'm naturally drawn to this because, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a traditionalist. Um, I'm kind of sentimental and I love the idea of maybe it's just the idea, but uh, because I'm a little romantic, I love the idea of being able to count on others and have them count on you. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, studies have shown that, that in Europe, when they remove stop signs, you know, we're, we're trained here to have four way stops. Uh, and so everybody kind of stops for a stop sign, but, but they've done studies where when they remove the traffic lights or the stop signs and everyone is responsible for their own safety, not assuming that other people will naturally stop, um, collisions go down. Accidents yeah, go down. I like, totally support that. Yeah. The, the, the more responsibility you take, the more mm-hmm. pressure you put on yourself. I, I, I used to be in a NASCAR racing. They developed this thing called the car of tomorrow, maybe 10 years ago now, where they wanted to create a safer car. So they put in safety barriers. They make everything about racing safer so that way uh, drivers are not injured or killed. A great thing to do. Well, what happens though, as soon as drivers realize they're in a safer car on a safer track, or they, they become more risky. Mm-hmm. They become bigger risk takers. The speeds go up. The aggression goes up. Hitting people go up. Everything becomes less safe because yeah. they're now in a safer environment. And so I can kind of see this idea of like the more responsibility we take, uh, the more pressure we put on ourselves, the, the, the better off we are. And then and then the other side of it, as you mentioned, in terms of community, you know, big cities, you know, you're, you don't know anyone. 
at all. Mm -hmm. The reason why small towns or small communities, um, perhaps, uh, and I, I don't have a study to reference, but no. perhaps um, are a little more tight knit or even a little more safe is you know the person or you've seen them, and you all gonna have to get along, right? Like you, you don't you don't have a choice if your um, safety or your ability to stay living counts on other people. You, you know, you can't be a jerk, right? You like, you just have to work through these things. So I'm almost like, I almost love the idea of just going off. I, I've talked to my wife for years. It's like, I just want like, I'd say people, I want to own both sides of the river. So, so <laughs> yeah. I want to be in Georgia or, or somewhere, you know, there. And I want to own, I want to have a property so large. I own both sides of the river. Cause usually the river or the Creek is kind of the natural boundary for property lines. And I just want to go in there and be left alone <laughs> completely. Yeah. I love this idea of it, but damn, it's a lot of work, right? It is. <laughs> that, and, I, and I and I want to overemphasize that because the pandemic also pushed a lot of people out of the cities. They started buying properties out in the middle of nowhere. And as you know, it's very romantic to think about a log cabin when in the in the mountain, you know, whatever, in a mountain town or in the mountains itself. And it sounds cool. It sounds beautiful. It sounds like a great way to go until you get in there. And there's been couples, families who have pulled the trigger on the lifestyle and then get about, you know, a couple of months in and go, whoa, this is not for me. They, they bit off a little more than they could chew. And really, it was because they didn't know what they were doing. You know, you buy a cabin in the middle of nowhere and think that, you know, chopping wood and having a fire every night. Yeah, that all sounds good, but there's, there's a whole lot more to it. And so this book was also about being realistic to this lifestyle, you know, and pointing out the financial piece, the labor that goes into it, uh, you know, and not to mention, you know, there's the, the, the first 10 questions at the beginning, like, is this for you? And, you know, the biggest one is, you know, you may love your family members, but do you like them? Because when you go down this path, <laughs> you know, and you're working together and you're all working on these tasks to the end goal, and that is to stay warm, put food on the table, maintain shelter, you know, you might be stressing your family out a whole lot. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, you have to take the, question, the questions at the beginning seriously, even though there's some tongue in cheek aspects to it. So a hundred deadly skills, rugged life, you know, ex Navy seal. Uh, of course I've got to ask you uh, zombie apocalypse. What do you do? <laughs> well, first you have to identify out of the 32 different kinds of zombies that I've seen listed. You have to identify which one it is you're dealing with. You know, how do you know, right? There's fast twitch. There's slow twitch. There's the ones that run fast. The ones that run slow. There's the ones that work in hives. You know, uh, there's some that only come out at night. I mean, but once you identify which one you're dealing with, then you can come up with the proper protocol to deal with it. What would be your plan? What would be, your, <laughs> I, I've got, I've got two plans. My wife and I talk about this all the time. What would be your go-to plan? Well, there's two plans that you effectively should have. There is the bug in and then there is the bug out, right? Now, bugging in means that you have basically fortified your current place where you live. You have all the supplies you need and you can really hunker down and survive. You can sustain life right now with everything you've got for a long period of time. The bug out means, okay, now I've got my bug out bag, my loadouts, I've got everything figured out and sorted that can go into a vehicle. The vehicle has, you know, $3,000 worth of cash inside, it already has all the fuel tanks that are full, so that once I start moving, I don't have to stop. And when I do stop, I'm paying cash all the way, and there's never going to be any other issue with me getting fuel to get to wherever it is I'm going, That you know, whether that's a you know, the evacuation route, or it's to your cabin in the mountains where, you know, you can hold up and be safe. But I mean, so, so you think fuel is actually, so this is interesting because the, the two plans, uh, I live, I live near <laughs> one of the great lakes. Yeah. I live about, um, gosh, I've run there. I live, uh, three miles from the edge of the great lake. Uh, nice. So I've always had two plans. I, I'm surprised you said cash because my plan was to just steal everything. <laughs> I imagine everything's going bananas. So either I go down to one of those uh, fancy uh, uh, marinas and I steal a large boat and then yep. I hunker down in the middle of a great lake because then, you know, 
You're no protected. one, yeah. I'm protected and I have fresh water access and, and I can fish and all that stuff. Or I head up north. I keep heading north, but I always thought the biggest issue would be uh, congestion and other people freaking out as opposed yeah. to like running out of fuel or food or anything like that. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I agree with everything you just said. I think really, you know, your your level of prep and status and know-how really drives the train on this at the end of the day, you know, like the bug in or bug out there, there it's two different worlds, but the goal is, you know, really avoiding, avoiding all of it. Right. I mean, if I'm going to take a route out of town, I'm not taking the one that's uh, most traveled. I'm going to take the route that's least traveled. Um, you know, if uh, money, money is great. Probably the first couple of weeks, you're going to run out, but people will take your money and money becomes it, it, it until other things begin, until we get into a bartering system, which is what's going to happen in a situation like that. Or let's go to real world. Like if you're going to talk about like you look at Russia invading Ukraine, you know, imagine what those people are going through and, the, and realizing, wow, I didn't really have a plan for this. I remember the interviews of Ukrainians before Russia invaded and they thought it was all fake news. Like, no, that's not happening. There's no one at our border. They're doing exercise. They actually believed what Russia was saying. And so did I, you know, I was surprised that probably, you know, most of the European countries also was like, yeah, he's not going to do it. But he did it. And then uh, people were left, you know, they're left stranded and, you know, and then they're forced to figure it out. That's figuring it out when it happens is the wrong time to figure it out as we, as we know. So having a plan goes a long way and then adjusting it accordingly, you know, obviously being flexible is, a, is also a great way to look at it too. I ask this question of everyone. And so I, I want to be able to ask you as well. I believe questions, the questions we run through our minds and then, and then the pursuit of that answer is one of the greatest things we can develop. And so in your training through BUDS, you know, you're, you're really getting beaten up. <laughs> when you're a SEAL, even, in, even now in the work that you're doing, when you are right up against the edge and you are ready to give up, what do you tell yourself or what question do you ask yourself? I mean, there's been a lot of moments where you weigh out the risk versus the reward. And then you go, what is the reward? Right. And, uh, but the reward for me was always like the greater good. You know, it was awesome to be always part of no matter how hard that mission was. Um, it was always being part of the greater good. That was the driving factor. And the reason why, me and my buddies never really quit, right? It's because you have to think outside of yourself, you know, and you have to kind of put those, the selfish side of it kind of to a side or at least compartmentalize it for that moment in time. And remember that what you're doing is for something greater. When I was a young frog man, you know, the driver was the achievement part getting to the trident and earning that emblem and wearing it on your chest. Like that's you, you're so hungry for it. And then nothing's going to get in your way. Once you get into the job, that selfishness starts to kind of become selflessness. Um, because you start looking around at your buddies and you start thinking about the things you're going and doing and going, Holy shit. Like these are missions that have an effect, not just on, you know, the future of America, but actually the future of the people in the country that we're going to, the future of the neighboring countries. Um, and then sometimes, you know, when you're, you know, going after terrorists, you're, you're helping out the globe, you know? So, you know, those moments when you may feel like you can't go any further, I would say you have to find something bigger than you to, you know, become the fuel. And I think that's what ultimately, that's what guys do. It starts out selfish. It starts out adrenaline and it starts out with fun, right? Because all of it is fun. You know, who doesn't like shooting and blowing shit up? And, you know, you feel like, yeah, you're risking your life, but you never really think about it that way. You're just going, oh, no, I'm doing my job. Um, but yeah, it, you know, you, if you get it, the opportunity, 
you know, to get into combat and actually do real world stuff, that's, that's, that's a moment when you, uh, you become more an adult in that realm and you think of things a lot differently than just about yourself. Clint, final question for you at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? I think at the end of the day, it all, it all, for me, it all comes down to family, you know, and I have a very, very little family left. And so that becomes more and more important. I've got a daughter and I've got a brother. That's it. And so that's uh, the, the less family you have, the more important they become. 